Good morning, everybody. Well, morning for me in Perth. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am, the uh, Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I would like to extend that re uh, respect to any First Nations people in this webinar today. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I feel like it's a very early in the year kind of webinar, but we've still had uh, about 50 people sign up, which is quite promising. Yes, I know we are towards the end of January, uh, but even though, uh, even so, I've, I've tended to avoid running events quite so early in the year. So uh, this webinar, um, oh, sorry, my name is Matthias Lippis, and I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons. Uh, I'll introduce all of our panelists shortly. Um, and so this webinar is about uh, peer e-research support methods or, or solutions, uh, things like that. Uh, you might have heard of Hacky Hour, uh, which is what a lot of people call this kind of peer e-research support, but in other organisations it might be called something different. So what do we have today? Uh, we have four amazing panellists. Um, who I will introduce in turn, uh, and uh, they will share a very quick story about how they're managing their particular peer e-research or how they might have done it in the past. Um, and then we will hopefully have time for a really nice long facilitated Q&A. Um, I do please ask that you keep yourself muted, although I'm not sure you can unmute yourself. It depends on how I've said everything in Zoom. Sorry, this is the first time I've actually used Zoom to run a webinar like this. Um, but if you do have any questions, please type them in the chat uh, and then I will uh, pick and choose those questions for our panellists or the panellists might choose to answer them directly in the chat. We'll see how we go. Okay, so uh, our four panellists today um, are Amanda Miotto from Griffith University and QCIF, um, Mariam Afzal Khan from Intersect and the University of Adelaide, uh, Gulam Mortaza from Intersect, uh, yep, yeah, Intersect, <laughs> just Intersect, and also Christian Goodacre from Positive Social Solutions. Um, all right, so, oh, and also I'd like to introduce my colleague Liz Stokes, who is uh, helping run the webinar today. And should I, should my NBN connection suddenly drop out, she will seamlessly and smoothly take over. All right, so first up today, um, we have Amanda Miotto, who is the QCF e research analyst at Griffith University. Uh, Amanda, you've been involved, or rather you've been running Hacky Hour for quite some time now, and you've got a lot of experience. Would you like to tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. Um, so I'm Amanda. Um, in our space, we've been running little catch-ups, um, basically open to anybody who wants to attend. Um, we've been calling them Hacky Hours, but we've been keeping, we're pretty happy for anyone to come in and ask any sort of questions. Um, so what we do is we treat it a little bit like a meetup. We say, all right, this coffee shop, this time, come on in. We based it from a model of uni in Melbourne and we're happy for any sort of topic. So we do get a lot of data science and a lot of people learning how to program and they want to come in and get a little bit of help around that. Um, we get a lot of people finish who have finished, um, software carpentry. So they're looking for a bit of help from there onwards. Um, some people who just want to come talk about compute, so whether they use HPC, but sometimes it's really open as well. So we'll get researchers being like, hey, what's available? Or I have a lot of data, what do I do with it? So we do use it a little bit of a triage as well. So we'll refer to different parts of the university. It's also really good to break up silos because you do find that researchers really sometimes don't get out of their lab groups or don't see people outside of that. So it gives them the opportunity to come on in meet, like we sometimes will bring along our storage team, like IT team, sometimes we'll bring along like an IP specialist. So it gives us the opportunity to be able to connect these people one-on-one. -on -one. And it's been really, really good. So we've been running for about four years now. Um, I do two different campuses because my university split over five, so we have two major ones. And I tend to find we get anything from one or two up to 10 people every week. I have noticed between five and seven people is that real momentum moment where you'll get like the same people come back every, every week. Whereas sometimes people will just stop in and grab their one problem consult and get back out again. I have noticed one of the things that has been really good is having a single coordinator. So having one person who is driving the whole thing. So doing the ads, um, making sure there is some people there to answer questions um, who can refer as well. 
So that's kind of a, a little bit of what we've been doing, but I'll answer some questions afterwards as well. So feel free to ask me anything. Great, thank you, Amanda. Okay, next up, I'd like to call on uh, Gulam, who is uh, currently the e-research service manager at Intersect, but did run Hacky Hours himself in a previous role. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please, Gulam? Thanks, Matthias. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, and my name is Gulam. <laughs> I'm e-research services manager, as Matthias said, uh, but I was... Uh, in the role of e-research analyst for a uh, good five years. Um, uh, one uh, first year was at ACU, and uh, since then for almost four, four and a half years at La Trobe University. Um, before I talk about La Trobe Hacky Hour, Amanda, I just wanna appreciate your uh, knowledge and uh, uh, how you have been so uh, you know kind and uh, so willing to help and share your knowledge about uh, how to run hacky hours with everyone and i still use uh, data to wiz.com uh, which you shared whenever i run a training i share with all the all the attendees and i think and, and i have to i have to thank you for that for sharing that in one of the uh, email lists uh, Yes, and thank God I'm not following you on any debate or anything because following you would be really hard. So, <laughs> okay, so uh, yes, so Latrobe University. Uh, we we started uh, Latrobe University uh, peer support, uh, uh, you know, catch ups uh, in 2017, uh, and I didn't call it Hacky Hour. Did you see that? So because we call them digital research drop-in sessions. Uh, so we got together uh, there at La Trobe University. Um, we were library, ICT, um, and research office. Uh, so I am, I am, I sit in ICT, I used to sit in ICT uh, at La Trobe University. And uh, we talked about uh, starting the Hacky Hour. Uh, I was uh, more in favor of Hacky Hour, uh, but, uh, uh, Andrew Williams from library, and I think rightly so uh, at the time, uh, he was at, at uh, La Trobe University, uh, now at Adelaide. Uh, uh, he, he made this point at the start, and then you know we, we all uh, agreed and he convinced us that uh, uh, calling it Hacky Hour might uh, you know, put off uh, people from humanities discipline and uh, maybe calling it digital research drop-in uh, session. Uh, would be a good idea. Again, I have no data that uh, how well this sits in as compared to Hacky Hour. Uh, but uh, then again, I mean, uh, we have uh, been seeing people from uh, multiple different disciplines uh, since then uh, who have come uh, to uh, get support. So a bit of uh, a bit about La Trobe. So La Trobe is uh, five different campuses, uh, and we were based at Pandura campus, and we used to run face-to-face -face physical uh, in a physical space within library. Uh, we used to uh, gather around. So we were uh, seven. We started with seven uh, people uh, who were there to support researchers, and we used to get two to three researchers. Uh, and at Max, I think we got five researchers who came to ask for help. Uh, in one of the sessions, and there were sessions when we did not get any uh, researchers uh, uh, come uh, to ask for help, but we still felt that they were useful sessions because seven of us would get together and talk about how uh, and what initiatives are being taken around digital research or e-research, as we call it more broadly, uh, in our own areas. Uh, so uh, uh, it was still very useful. and. Uh, in uh, the COVID environment, we moved to online, uh, uh, you know, Zoom-based hacky uh, digital research drop-in sessions, and uh, we experienced that uh, uh, the uh, researchers from regional campuses they appreciated uh, that uh, quite a bit, and we saw a few people from regional campuses who had come along uh, because we had that complaint in the past. Uh, that uh, because we tried to set up physical in Bandura and then get uh, a coordinator in uh, a librarian, uh, laser librarian in one of the campuses to set up Hacky Hour there, it didn't really work uh, uh, because uh, if they had some 
uh, Python related question and I was the only one who could answer and there is a researcher here. So it was lots of complication, uh, you know, uh, uh, lots of complications there. Uh, but in terms of uh, people coming uh, for support, so we have like, you know, multiple different topics. So we had a, we had a promotion flyer where we would mention all the, uh, you know, kind of possible uh, topics or questions or areas in which we can help. Uh, we felt that uh, maybe, uh, you know, we could do like, you know, a roadshow kind of, we can go to different faculties. So we have, we have uh, discussed that idea. We were never able to act on that. Uh, but then again, I would be, I would be interested to hear uh, if somebody did that and how did, how did they go with that? Um, and now going onwards, uh, what we have uh, thought is that we'll, uh, at La Trobe University, I still say we, even though I'm not any decisionist there, but, but I'm still involved in, in some capacity. Um, uh, what what uh, we have decided is that we'll keep, uh, uh, so we used to do monthly and in online environment, we started fortnightly and we thought it was still worth it to do fortnightly. So we have decided that uh, we would do alternate. So even if we go back uh, to face-to-face uh, -face mode and we all uh, go back to before COVID days, which I'm not sure how possible is that, uh, we would still do one online and one face-to-face. -face. So uh, one fortnight would be online and the other would be face-to-face -to, -face to just facilitate the remote uh, researchers. So that's, that's pretty much uh, it, I guess. And I'm happy to discuss more in questions. Great, thank you very much for that, Gulam. Okay, next up, we are moving over to uh, Gulam's colleague, Mariam. Uh, so Mariam Afzal Khan works uh, as um, an e-research analyst at the University of Adelaide. She's been in the role for slightly under a year. So she's all very new to running Hacky Hours, uh, which I thought was great because it gives us the opportunity to hear the perspective of somebody who is quite fresh at doing this. So over to you, Mario. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Matthias. And yes, uh, you sort of hit the nail on the head uh, that our experience at Adelaide uh, and myself personally is a little bit different from Amanda and Gulam, even though I echo everything that you guys are saying, our experience is similar in, in some ways, but we do have a, a unique uh, perspective, I guess, because we didn't have a hacky hour until, until the middle of last year. So we started in the middle of a pandemic, all online, which uh, which was scary, and I'm sure I mean it was it was interesting. Um, and I thought that I'd just briefly touch on um, maybe some of the things that we learned or some of the, the choices that we made uh, when we were starting our hacky hour uh, in these in these circumstances. And maybe if somebody else is thinking of doing the same, it will be uh, it will be useful. So basically, when we were starting, our major concern was you know how what Amanda just talked about that momentum moment where. The, the spirit of a hacky hour is that you have researchers helping researchers and you have that peer support network. But we were concerned when we were starting how to get to that kind of momentum moment where we have enough researchers coming regularly and and uh, and helping each other out. Um, because there is gonna be that interim period when we're starting uh, and to, to get that to get that kind of traction. Um, so we so to kind of keeping keeping that concern in mind, we decided to go with a slightly more structured approach, at least initially. So we do keep themes for our hacky hours. We put them up a couple of hacky hours in advance for uh, on, on our webpage. Um, and I think that really does help in getting researchers' attention if they just saw a, a news item in, in a newsletter saying, oh, general, you know, catch up for researchers that might not attract attention. But if somebody says, these ANSYS or MATLAB or HPC, they're more likely to, to join and just see you know, what's happening. And I think that that definitely has happened. But another thing that if we do have themes uh, in advance, it helps us make sure that we can have some specialist expert, I don't want, like using the word expert, but specialist or somebody who's experienced in that tool or somebody who manages that service at Adlis, for example, for HPC, the HPC admin, or somebody who can, so we can sort of have this one, one we can put in our comms. So that, that attracts, again, researchers to say, oh, you can talk to the HPC admin face to face instead of from, you know, behind a help desk ticket or something. Um, but also, it also ensures that when a researcher does come and they do bring a question, uh, that we are, well, there's a very high probability that we'll be able to solve that problem for them. We don't want researchers to come in the beginning and 
not find it useful, not find a solution. And then the hacker would start getting a bit of a reputation that it's not very useful. So we were very kind of concerned about that. And we wanted to make sure that researchers who do come do find it useful and do keep coming again and again. Um, so I think that sort of really helped us. Uh, another thing that we did, which has been really successful and hopefully we're going to do more of it, is that we do, other than uh, having specialists from within the university, we do invite external ven vendors as well. So we did a session for, for example, ANSYS, uh, and uh, we asked the vendor, which is LEAP, they already do trainings at University of Adelaide, so they had a couple of their trainers join our, our hacky hour. Uh, and that was, I think, our log. Uh, that hack year, I think, went on for almost two hours. Like, there was like a lot of discussion, a lot of conversation. Um, and again, that was another way to kind of engage, uh, engage those researchers, and and hopefully, uh, hopefully they found it useful and will be coming back again and again. So yeah, so I guess that's what I'll say for now. Just that if you are starting out, you may want to think about how you get that kind of traction initially. And I guess over time, once you do get that 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 critical mass. Um, it can sort of go into a more organic, unstructured kind of uh, format, which is hopefully what we'll see at Adelaide um, this year. Yeah, I guess that's all I'll say for now and happy to talk about more in Q&A. Thank you very much for that, Mario. All right, then uh, our final panelist is Christian Goodacre from Positive Social Solutions. Uh, now feel free to start sharing your slides there, Christian. Uh, so Christian will tell us a little bit about what he does and um, might even touch a little bit on work he's done with some previous clients of his. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Matthias. I can certainly relate to everybody who's uh, on the panel as well. Uh, over the last uh, year, I had I had the uh, the privilege of working alongside CSIRO uh, during the the COVID pandemic to really sort of scale uh, their data school initiative, which was a um, a coding uh, virtually delivered peer learning course that ran over about six weeks, two half days a week uh, with both science researchers as well as enterprise staff that were working with data and digitally as well. So it was quite a diverse um, audience. And as you all know, it's, it's great everybody's in the training session, but what happens before and after is really important in keeping people engaged and using those skills and feeling confident as they grow in their proficiency. Um, and what we trialled um, alongside Hacky Hours, so CSIRO did run monthly uh, Hacky Hour webinars where they had a subject matter expert from a different domain or technology uh, showcasing a, a really quick, relevant um, way to use that tool to do their work. And uh, like uh, Amanda and Mariam have just said, is putting a face to the name was really important in promoting some of those internal events. But these study pods that I've kind of tried to summarize in these five somewhat catchy blue boxes, I would feel, um, ran alongside the actual forming, the, the formal training program that we ran and were very much a drop in whereby the participants could come along, meet up with uh, coaches who were alumni from previous data school programs um, and get support in practicing their, their coding as well as working on the, um, uh, the, the capstone project that they were working with. Now that capstone project as well was in two formats. So you had everybody from all these different science domains and research domains um, working with a similar data set, which made it very easy or a lot easier for the coaches, I think, to provide that tuition within these breakout groups. Um, but then they also started working with their own data, both enterprise and research data, which make it a lot more complex. And that's where I feel uh, some of these uh, points here that are a bit of a, a lessons learned or summary are, are really important in that making it fun and friendly really uh, makes it something that people want to want to talk about and come back to. So making the uh, making things light in a, a very hectic workday uh, really allowed uh, those coaches and our team to to make sure that people returned, even if uh, I think what. Mariam or maybe Amanda was saying, if they just pop in to say hi or see what other people are working on, it's that sort of social connection, which was really important. And briefing and equipping those coaches. So those alumni that were in these breakout rooms virtually, mind you, this is all virtual, um, to support on average kind of between eight and 10 uh, people that would come along with their own queries or questions for what they're working on was really important so that they had an enjoyable experience as a coach 
and didn't feel overwhelmed and also knew that there was back channels within um, Office 365 teams where they could ask for support from other coaches that might not have as many people in their breakouts, for example, or our subject matter lead of data school, Stephen Pierce, um, who is exceptionally proficient across uh, the entire curriculum um, and skills. Uh, and as, as technology changed throughout the year, you saw this, this kicked off very much in the, in the thick of COVID in, in, um, in March, March and April. We kind of fully switched to, to blending WebEx as the video delivery platform and um, Office 365 Teams and Yammer as two of the different uh, learning hubs. We were really, a, really also able to make sure that what was happening in each of those breakout rooms was also um, posted within chat channels so that if you weren't in that room, you could poke your head in there after virtually and have a look at the different code snippets that might also be useful to you. So I found that was actually something really uh, unexpected and surprising that benefited other, other participants who were busy and might not have been able to make it either on the day or, or kind of skip between the different rooms. Um, and consistency, I think, I think that consistency, what um, uh, I think Miriam might have mentioned around having a program uh, manager or lead to make sure there is a full calendar, people have something to look forward to, they know when it is, and they've been consulted on what might be uh, the best times and, and locking that in for a certain period of time and being open to also refreshing that as, as the year goes on. Uh, so that's all for me, I hope that's my five. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much for that, Christian. Um, yes, you do uh, raise a good point about um, Microsoft Teams. Uh, I actually found it annoying the how if you are not in a video, the video portion of a meeting, you still get the notifications from the chat. But now in retrospect, that's actually also a useful feature, be able to see that chat log after the meeting's finished, for example, or as it happens. Uh, because with Zoom, uh, as far as I'm aware, unless you save the chat before the meeting ends or before you leave the meeting, it's all gone. It just vanishes into the ether. Uh, so keeping that record is a, an interesting thing. Now, uh, we haven't had any uh, questions show up in the chat just yet, although uh, Liz did share something I was going to get Amanda to talk about very, very quickly. Um, and that is about your Hacky Hour handbook that you have on GitHub. Uh, now I have been told by several people that it is a, a very useful resource. So could you tell us a little bit about that please, Amanda? Sure. Um, it's just something we put together. It was our findings when we started putting Hacky Hours together of who are really good people to invite, um, what we found people asked for. We did find that um, it was really good to have things like HPC and library and a whole heap of other areas involved as well. So we just kind of wanted to share our lessons learned. And I put up a list of all the bookmarks that I use just day to day when people email and ask about different courses and stuff. I've put that up on GitHub as well. So, and the website that was mentioned before, data to fizz is amazing. I just said, put a link in the chat as well. Highly recommend you check it out because it shows you all different graphs and what the Python and R code is for it as well. Um, so in the bookmarks, um, I've included a whole heap of different things like that. I'm always keen to see what else you guys have. So please send it to me or um, just drop it in as an issue for the GitHub. And, we'll, and yeah, more than happy to sort of ask any questions around that as well. Great, thank you, Amanda. Still no questions in the chat, unfortunately. Come on, everyone. It's a, a, an interactive Q and A session. Um, now we've we've all been uh, talking about how you've been getting some good results uh, with your hacky hours. I wonder if anyone is going to be brave enough to let us know about a time or an instance where something went a little skew with, uh, and and perhaps how you recovered from that, or, or what the what the lesson you learned from that was. Would anybody like to talk to that? I can talk about what we found. I found moving to virtual, we didn't find it as good as being in on house. I found when we started doing it as virtual, because we basically asked, we asked people what kind of questions they'd have and put them into individual rooms. Then you'd have wait times where people would be like, well, I need to talk to, to like that Python person if they were busy. We ended up, for this. we do it normally during the summer anyway, switching over to say, all right, well, tell us who you like, 
what you're looking for and we'll do a virtual consult. I do want to really get in-person ones happening again because I think it's nice, especially at the moment when you don't get that human interaction. While saying that, I know heaps of the virtual ones have worked really well, so I think we're still playing around with our format as well. Great. Thanks, Amanda. I think, Christian, you might have had – you unmuted yourself? Yeah, I unmuted myself. I think, uh, Gulam, you mentioned before what happens when uh, you had an experience where no one turned up to a certain session, and I can relate. We had lots of uh, eager – tutors or, co or coaches lined up for multiple uh, breakout rooms, for example, and everyone arrives in a plenary and then we uh, triage people off based on what's going on. And there's all there's a few cases where, uh, yeah, some of the eager coaches were left without anybody. And uh, in, in that case, uh, we had a quick debrief on the side as the kind of coordinator, myself and the coach, but then also just give them the option to join another because that then alleviates the pressure on that other uh, coach to have so many different questions or, or have all those people waiting for their, for their time or, or moment in the spotlight, I guess. Um, and just reinforcing that like turning up is important in case no one comes. So make sure you're there next week um, rather than just cull it back to a few coaches because you didn't have uh, as many. And then suddenly the next week has blown out into this huge... Uh, participant number and you're racing around trying to message people to get 20 minutes of their time so yeah that's that's kind of how we got around that but it's it definitely will most likely happen at some point great thanks christian um now now christian you already talked about uh using yammer and teams and things like that um but uh, a question that uh the, the others might like to have a crack at as well is how do you keep the community connected between sessions? I know for us, we run Twitter. Uh, we have a Twitter account. We do a lot of posting around different resources we have, we have available. Um, so we do try to keep that, but we do do them weekly. So for us, it's not well, formatly, I guess. So we do use that, um, whether that helps. Uh, for for Latrobe, so we we run a pretty uh, a packed training uh, uh, you know calendar. So we have uh, uh, you know trainings coming up. So in in trainings, uh, we mention Hacky Hour, and we have like lots of usual suspects coming to training and to Hacky Hour like drop in session as well. So uh, it, it feels like we we stay connected, uh, but. Just, just on the previous point as well, uh, that uh, I think uh, the value of just showing up uh, uh, just for uh, the the mentors, as Christian said, or uh, like you know the helpers, as as we say, uh, like from different departments, uh, we we found was was really good. Even if there is no one, we are just chatting among ourselves that what's going on in the research area in our in our respective. Uh, respective departments. Um, I think. It, I think, and, and everyone agrees uh, uh, that you know that we should keep coming, and they do keep coming every uh, every fortnight. And especially in face of COVID, we uh, it, it was emphasized that you know just just getting together. It was another avenue where we we are meeting our colleagues uh, when we are not face to face. I think it really helped there as well. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, another question. I think somebody's interested uh, whether anybody has returned to doing face-to-face -face hacky hours yet, or whether everyone is still very much online and will be for for the time being. Has anybody is anybody planning to go back to face-to-face -to -face anytime soon? We might experiment with it at Adelaide just because you've never done face-to-face, -face, uh, but. Online has been working really well for us. So we're not, I mean, we have no reason to, it might just be a bit of an experiment just to see uh, if there is a difference, if there's a difference in engagement and so on. But online has worked. I mean, I think others would have found the same. It's worked really well for us for remote campuses, you know, people coming in from remote campuses. It's also really helped. So when I was talking about having external vendors come, Leap is based in Sydney. So you can have, you know, even mentors from, from elsewhere come in. So I, I don't feel a particular push to go face to face. Great, thank you. Okay, another interesting question. Uh, and look, this actually does go back to what I called this whole webinar, peer e-research support. 
Um, so question, has anyone managed to get researchers to pick up and answer hacky our questions themselves instead of research support staff? For us, we have. Um, we find that we've had a couple of academics who just like to get out of their offices and come and have coffee. We give them free coffee as well, which is always a nice bribery. Um, we do find that we get that a bit, but what we find as well is if we have PhD students we've trained up for a year or two, they end up becoming ECRs and training up their PhD students. So we'll see labs, not so much going out and helping people outside their labs, but labs internally evolving as well. So we have seen there's especially two or three major ones where you can see their technology growing over time as well. Um, so yeah, we do get a couple, we probably get say, uh, I don't know, two academics come along and come and help out, maybe three. We do find as well, IT guys who aren't e-research or really research related also really like free coffee. So they'll occasionally come on down and help with Python or something like that. Great, thank you, Amanda. Okay. Um... Christian, this uh, question is specifically for you. Um, with the recording of the sessions, did you find that people were more hesitant to participate? I know I was at the beginning, uh, <laughs> but no, I just, I posted a little reply there, but um, in short, the Ag and Food team that really pioneered data school at CSIRO back in 2017, 18, they really set up a clear, um, uh, code of conduct that mimicked or leveraged the carpentry's philosophy and blended that with CSIRO's code of conduct and the FAIR principles to really make learning more about the individual. So this is bigger than you. It's really important that we record this so that we can share it as a resource. Um, and no, you know, we had a really solid mix of people, but keep but I think when we explained how important it was to keep your camera on for that social connection element um just just based on like virtual learning principles and best practices it's uh yeah people just seem to to participate we didn't have no I don't, I don't recall anybody that was really anti-participating purely because of um I think video or, or online delivery luckily Great, thanks, Christian. Uh, okay, we have a comment, uh, not a question, but a comment from Aero, uh, Australian e-research organizations. So Aero maintains a national registry of e-research support. And so they would appreciate it uh, if you were to um, submit yourself to the registry. So please email phil at aero.edu.au. The email address is in the chat there as well. Okay. Um, there's, so, uh, sorry, a nice long question. Um, so this is around the Rocho idea that Gulam mentioned. Um, so this is one of our colleagues from Auckland, similar idea to visiting different faculties and bringing happy hour tutorials and talks themed about research methods and data of those faculties. Uh, has anybody else have had any experience or thoughts on this kind of thing? So if I would, I would also like to hear, but, <laughs> but I'll, just, I'll just add, add a little bit. So we, we thought about it uh, at the start of last year uh, and COVID happened, we couldn't do roadshows, but I think like now in like COVID normal, whatever it would be, I mean, I think it would be mostly online stuff. So uh, maybe there is an opportunity for Latrobe to go back, and I think I'll, I'll uh, restart these conversations in the near future as well with the e-research analysts there and internal people there as well to possibly go ahead and do that. And I'm happy to share it uh, or share our feedback uh, from from that in any future sessions. Thanks, Kulam. Was there anybody else who has who has tried that idea, thinking about it? No? All right then. Uh, tell you what, a uh, colleague from Auckland, give it a go and let us know how you go. Um, we, we would really appreciate uh, anything that anybody else has to share as well. Uh, please do so in the chat. Um, okay, we've still got heaps of time, which is great because we are getting lots of questions in and hopefully I haven't missed any. 
Oh, wait, here's one that I missed. Um, has anybody joined up their hacky hour with a research champions program um, where regulars take on a, a bit of a teaching role as well? Okay, not necessarily anybody on this panel. Um, I was going to say, we've had a few people we've met through Hacky Hours who have come and helped software carpentries, but that's probably the closest we've gotten. Okay, so not necessarily a formal uh, a formal program, just, a, oh, hey, you seem useful, let's come and help us teach. Okay. Um, great, thanks for that, guys. Okay, now we're, oh, here we go. Um, another question about gender balance in participants and coaches. So is, has there been, or have you found that there is a, a good balance there? Um, if not, have you done anything to address that? Or is there anything you have been able to do to address that? I have noticed um, that generally uh, our hacky hours, both, I mean, our coaches and the people who are attending, the researchers, they are, it's a very male dominated uh, group in general. That's just an observation It's something I've noticed. I haven't actively done anything about it. I'm not sure if something can actively be done. Maybe we can on the, on the coaches end, um, but we can't, I guess, orchestrate <laughs> who, who shows up to, to some extent. Thank you, Mariam. Christian? Yeah, yeah quickly, Matthias. Um, in, in CSIRO last year, because the, the, the primary pool of coaches we were sourcing came from um, alumni from the skilling program called, called Focus, uh, in the recruitment of participants to that program, there was a really clear mandate for inclusion to make sure there was um, a balanced mix of, of gender as well as ge physical geographies, given it's a national organization. Uh, so those, because they were part of the selection criteria um, downstream, our coaches were able to be quite, um, yeah, balanced in that sense. And, and then our sort of secondary pool again, yeah, it's kind of front and foremost, especially, you know, with our diversity inclusion policies that are out there, it's, it's really important to see um, and be able to interact with people of all different backgrounds, genders, sociocultural backgrounds, yeah. Great, thanks, Christian. Uh, Amanda or Willem, did you have anything to add to that before we move on? Uh, uh, I, I just, uh, sorry. Uh, I, I have, we have had the same experience as Mayim, uh, and uh, yes, I, I, yeah, we haven't done a lot about it, uh, I'd admit, but I think we, we wish we need to look at that. For us, um, I just shared a link of some hacky hour statistics, including some gender demographics from 2018 that we did up. Um, yeah, we definitely still get a few more males, but we do get females in there as well. I do tend to find they're a little bit quieter or something. Sometimes you have to nudge them a little bit to get them a bit more chatty. Um, but other than that, yeah, I'm not, we do, I quite often refer, um, there's some female friendly meetups like Women Who Code and stuff that I'll quite often refer to and from as well. So I don't know if, I don't know what else to do, I guess is a good question. So we do just kind of keep it pretty open to anybody. Our stats probably for this year, or for last year, sorry, 2020, probably do look a bit better gender-wise, but it's because we've had a lot of librarians attend, which do tend to be more so in females. So, but participant-wise, still maybe a third to two thirds. Great, thanks, Amanda. Okay, now I, uh, where was it? something about coffee sorry scrolling up and down um yes amanda uh you again so uh this idea of giving free coffee to people but also sort of backtracking a bit how long did you find it took to get that critical mass in your hacky hour and also have you noticed uh perhaps a bit of a drop off in attendance attack hours now that people can't get free coffees anymore 
Um, so on the free coffees, sometimes it's not bad to get people there on the first time, but I do find that they come back with that and not always stressed about getting their free coffee. So it's a nice incentive, but I don't think it's an essential. Um, it's just like a nice little thing that you can do. Um, what was the first question? Sorry. Oh, how long it takes. Um, our momentum's really ebb and flow. So, and I find between the two campuses as well, it can be very, very different. I'll have, you know, a couple of months where I'll get a huge amount of Gold Coast people and Nathan will be dead quiet. Like we do run the occasional hack hour and we don't get people. Um, or we'll get two or three and then I do tend to find after a little bit of that we'll get a momentum and have seven or eight and they'll be consistent for a month or two or three and then a holiday will happen or we break for Christmas or something and it dies down. So I have tried mapping academic calendars, um, public holidays to how many people we get to turn up week by week and there is zero patterns I can find. So um, it probably... We found Gold Coast picked up pretty quickly because we hit a big group there that were already doing quite a lot of Python and C and Linux. So whereas Nathan did definitely take a lot longer to ramp up. Um, so yeah, there's no real strict rule or pattern that I found. Occasionally you'll get a new group that you discover and they're all really into it and then they'll kind of train up for a bit and they'll ebb for a bit and then they'll get new PhD students and come back. So it is very, dependent on what groups you have around that particular campus. Great, thank you. Uh, now I see that uh, in our chat, we've um, someone sharing links to the TU Delft um, uh, Data Champions program and linking that with data management support. Um, and I do know that uh, Curtin University, for example, also has a, a, they started last year, a research data champions program uh, drawing upon members of the faculty to be to sort of assist with the outreach uh, and engagement with regards to research data management and other e-researchy things uh, within the faculty. Now, I believe that the questions have started to dry up. Uh, but we are at quarter to the hour and I do like to finish meetings early to give everybody a good chance to have uh, to get a glass of water before their next meeting. Um, so I would uh, first like to thank all of our panellists uh, for attending today. It's been quite insightful. Um, if you do have um, any further questions or you want to get in touch with any of our panellists, uh, feel free to email me, matthias.livis at ardc.edu.au. Um, and I uh, will be um, emailing uh, the recording of this session around to everybody who has attended. Um, now, uh, if anybody has any, we're at the beginning of the year, if you have any requests for future webinars from the ARDC, uh, could you please let us know? Um, so we've, we've got our own ideas of what we'd like to do, but of course, um, we should also run things that other people would like to see. Uh, so please put your ideas in the chat. Um, I'll leave this meeting open for a little bit so you can put your ideas down. Um, uh, Gulam, you have raised your hand. So I've raised hand for two reasons. One, I wanted to say something and second, I wanted to try this feature. <laughs> so, uh, Yes, I just wanted to quickly share. Uh, so a colleague from Western Sydney, so e-research analyst from Western Sydney University, I was having a chat with him yesterday about uh, this session. Uh, he unfortunately, I think, couldn't make it. So on his behalf, uh, so they are just starting the Hack Yawa, and he mentioned that they are going the route of uh, registering people for a specific uh, Hack Yawa uh, day, like, you know, a week. Uh, and they got 70 people registered for that. And uh, I was amazed by it. And uh, uh, I think that is another option to actually go regist registration route. And uh, well, it could, it could blow, blow up on you very quickly. 70 people, how are you gonna ever support uh, that many people in one session? I think they are going to uh, have multiple people and multiple sessions and whatnot. Uh, he was explaining the whole thing, but uh, yes, uh, that was uh, his uh, experience at Western Sydney. All right, 70 people registered. Do you know how many people 
showed up or has the session oh, it, not happened yet? It, it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, so okay. it was yesterday. I think it's happening in, in a week, so a couple of weeks time. Yeah, okay. Well, it'd be very interesting to hear about how that yeah. has gone. Um, so, um, yep, with that, with that in mind, thank you very much for coming. Um, and yes, please do put your ideas for future webinars in the chat. Um, I will hang online for a few minutes more to let you get your ideas out. Uh, but otherwise, a thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to Liz for moderating the chat while I'm gas bagging. Uh, and thank you to all of our attendees for coming and listening and participating. Have a great day.